can look at different gender differences, ethnic differences, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's not just the morph and it's not certainly not promising a um, result, but it's communication, it's uh, screening patients, and it's performing research yeah. that I think are... Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three. We're doing face-to-face -face interviews. And uh, I'm in Berlin at the Global Masters Meeting for IMRS, managing to pull together a couple of guys who I haven't spoken to before and other guys who have, and it's been very interesting. And one of the people today is who was the most watched and listened to podcast from last year was uh, Derek Steinbachers. Derek, thank you so much for availing yourself for another chat. Absolutely, yeah, such a pleasure and good to connect again. Yeah, man, listen, and so uh, it was so good to see how many people were interested in this whole orthognatic uh, chat we had last year. But today I wanna explore something a little bit more different, which is the whole thing about 3D and 3D printing and morphing, etc. I know it's one of your passions, so maybe you want to tell the listeners a little bit, before we get into that, what's been happening in your life in the last year? Yeah, those are all good questions. And, you know, the biggest thing really is I've had a slight shift of practice location where yeah. I'm totally on my own in my own center and my yeah. own uh, surgery center and clinic space. So, you know, that's been good and it's going really well. And it's enabled me the chance to develop and create my own 3D room to do some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, I know yeah. we touched on it last time and one of my talks here talked a little bit about cone beams and 3D cameras, simulation, morphing and patient education and those kinds of things. So, and, be and what has it been like for you now to be on your own? Eh? Yeah, no, it's, it's good. Now it's uh, a way to really focus on these types of cases and offer boutique care and really control the patient experience from, you know, their initial inquiry all the way through consultation, surgery, and the post-operative care. So it's, um, you know, it's great. And it's the ultimate in autonomy, especially with one's own surgery center to be able to yeah, yeah. control that entire process. Well, that's what we we did. We built a slightly bigger center in South Africa and we've been open for almost two years now. And it's just, it's so nice to have your own place. Absolutely. So, so do you have an OR in the surgical center? Yeah, yeah okay. exactly, exactly. And where is that? It's so, it's still in Connecticut. It's kind of the midpoint of Connecticut. It's okay. about 70, 80 miles from New York City, yeah. maybe a hundred miles from Boston. Okay. Um, still close to the center of the state. And, yeah. you know, so we get people coming from all over the place. It's really convenient, easy to fly to and yeah. get to. And and Derek, you're like, you're a passionate teacher and you you're good at what you're doing, you're teaching. I mean, I've absolutely loved listening to your talks here. Is there a possibility for people to come and visit you and also learn or not? No, there is, yeah, for sure. And right now we have a, a research fellow from Cambridge in the UK. We have visiting doctors and yeah. you know, we're starting to get students, medical students and residents from different backgrounds that are gonna be coming and shadowing as well. So. Uh, definitely easy and possible to do and we're still continuing some of these yeah. academic pursuits and how do they reach out to you um via email or instagram and i can give you all that information to okay. to put in the show notes if that's okay, uh, no, we'll helpful. Do that. yeah. definitely yeah. yeah okay so tell me a little bit more about your 3d room yeah so um you know i do mac a lot of maxillofacial and bony sort of facial implants as well and orthognathic surgery in addition to rhinoplasty you know, those are my two biggest areas mm. that we focus on. And, um, you know, so in our 3D room, we have a cone beam CT scan, which is, of course, great for orthognathic and required for those types of workups and planning. But I think it's very, very beneficial and valuable for rhinoplasty as well. We don't obtain a CT on every rhinoplasty patient, but having those tools at our disposal and at our disposal, in, in addition to some of the endoscopy, mm -hmm. uh, naso endoscopy type tech, uh, technology as well, is is very helpful. And I think it goes a long way with communication and education to the patients as well. So you know, a portion of it is certainly the CT analysis, in addition to physical exam and yeah, yeah. endoscopic exam. Uh, but then the big component, especially for aesthetic rhinoplasty, which is the majority you know, of what we're doing, yeah. is having that 3D camera. 
Yeah. We take 2D films, but having the 3D camera is great because you're sitting with the patient and or their family members. Is the, is that, if I say 3D, is that the vector system that you use? It's the vector system. Because it's the same system yeah. that I use. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great system. And in real time, we look at the morphology and the anatomy yeah. of the patient together. And it's frequently the first time that they've really seen their face, you know, kind of stepping outside of it because people take selfies or look yeah. at the mirror, but it's kind of that mirror image and doesn't really have the same capability of the 3D camera where you're rotating it and looking yeah. at it from different angles what the morphology is. So that's, you know, after the physical exam and talking a bit about their goals and what they want done, this is what we do. And we look at those images and just have them take it in. I don't say much. We rotate it and then start having, you know, give a little bit of silent time for them to take it in and comment on what they see before yeah, I start, yeah, yeah. you know, in with my diagnosis and things that I may see that, you know. Isn't it? I, I find one of my favorite views on Victor is showing the asymmetry of the face because you can have this patient come in and they demanding all sorts of things and then you show them just how asymmetric their face is and they there's that stunned silence. They're like, who's that on the picture? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know, I use it a lot too for some of the facial aging patients and yeah. starting from the top down and looking at ptosis and eyelids yeah. and brow yeah. position yeah. and right and dark yeah. circles and jowls in addition to the nose and the jawline and lips and ears and those kinds of things. So it's very powerful and very communicative uh, with a patient because I think it's important that they understand what it is that we're seeing and what the common yes. goals are. So a question I have here, Lissandra Martins uh, from Brazil, what he gets his patients to do is actually send him pictures of what they would like their nose to look like. What are your thinking around that? Yeah, I don't necessarily request that, but plenty of patients will come with those yeah. types of things, um, which is you know, sometimes instructive and sometimes they're totally unrealistic. You know, if it's a very thick skin patient and they're showing patients of very thin skin um, post-op results or maybe filtered results and those kinds of things, yeah. you know, we need to take that um, into consideration to make sure the patient is aware that some things are achievable and some things are not achievable. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's also very powerful with a 3D camera that we can try to say, you know, these are things that can be achieved and these are things that cannot be achieved. Yeah. So uh, trying to train and track slightly is tech in, in the firm of like med tech, in, in a way, maxillofacial surgery is so far ahead of the rest of us. Like piezo is kind of came into rhinoplasty a few years ago, but they've been done, done for more than two decades with you guys and 3D printing, et cetera, et cetera. I had a very interesting discussion with Brian Wong the other day, and I'd really be interested to know what your thoughts are on this whole idea of cartilage printing. Do you think that's something that's going to be coming? What are some of your thoughts around that? Yeah, no, that's that's inter that's kind of tangential to this for sure. But yeah, very yeah. interesting. And people have done that and presented a lot on this related to ear reconstruction or ear yeah. construction, for sure. I think certainly some of these scaffold or scaffold material and potentially seeding it with stem cells or seeding with cartilage. Yeah. Um, maybe the next thing on the horizon before actually just printing cartilage, yeah, yeah. maybe it'll be printing scaffolds that then you seed yeah. in the cells, yeah. you seed with cells in the lab. And then once those cells become more viable, then you can implant it. But yeah. um, I think, yeah, that would be great. It would save donor sites. You could maybe print things exactly the dimensions that you need or want. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I don't think that's too far away, actually. Yeah. Derek, it's, so I'm, I'm friends with a lot of Max Fax people back in South Africa, like really good mates of mine. And uh, um, with our society of Saucer, et cetera, we, we're very open to working with specialists around the, like the table on the, on the nose. My question is, why is it that like a, the, a maxillofacial surgeon has got such incredible skills and understanding of the anatomy of the face and stuff, but then just this little, and I'm generalizing now, a lot of the guys then don't want to touch the nose. And I'm like, Bro, why can't you touch the nose? You know so much about the face. So I, I, why do you think that is? Or am I completely wrong in what I'm saying now? Yeah, and I think there's differences in different regions. You know, that's been some of the discussion here at this meeting is that um, some of the European places, you know, there's no comfort or training in doing jaw surgery or orthognathic surgery, or even yeah. we had a session on cleft rhinoplasty and to my way of thinking 
if you're doing the rhinoplasty and the lip needs to be revised, I certainly do that at the same time. Yeah. And then I think of things in context from infancy through childhood through when they're ready for orthognathic surgery and rhinoplasty. And I think having those things sequenced appropriately and executed and performed well sets the stage for the best rhinoplasty results. So yeah. I think, yeah, it's a two-edged sword in that yeah. um, all these things are interrelated and whether or not one does all of the things, I don't think is an absolute and necessary, but certainly collaborating with people that are very comfortable with the nose or are very yeah, yeah. comfortable with the bone grafting or yeah. speech surgery or orthognathic Lafort surgery. And if you happen to do all of them and do all of them well, I, I think that is a good paradigm. But I think um, having those components at the patient's disposal is, is ideal. Yeah. No, that's very inspiring. I mean, I think there's for the for the listeners out there, you must I think the the take home message here is is become excellent in what you're doing, you know? Oh. So Different question. On your WhatsApp profile, I see there's a picture of you. It looks like you're on a boat. Uh, Tell me a bit about that, man. Yeah, yeah. So I'm in um, kind of coastal New England yeah, area. Yeah. You know, it's somewhat New York-like. It's somewhat New England. Yeah. Um, and there's certainly a lot of boating and things uh, of that sort. Unfortunately, not year-round because yeah. the winters can be pretty dreadful and yeah. cold. And yeah. unless you're a fisherman or a lobsterman, you know, you, people aren't going out on yeah. the boats uh, past November or October even. Yeah. But in the summer, it's it's great. And, you know, we're at a place of four seasons where, you know, you can really um, have different experiences depending on the type of time of year so yeah yeah Derek one last question so how do you manage now I guess it's easier now that you uh, have your own place but you, you travel quite a lot and you go to various conferences and you're speaking etc how do you get the balance right yeah I think you know um, that's always a, a challenge I think but I think it's important to continue to participate in these both to share the knowledge that we have or I have or have developed over the years and learn from other colleagues. Um, I think, you know, that's what our patients expect and that's what's best for patient care and getting the best results possible. So um, obviously you can't travel every single week or month and, you know, there, there is a balance to that. And I love performing surgery and yeah. giving patient care. So that takes the priority, but, you know, some of these, um, experiences and meetings are, are priceless really in the, the amount of knowledge that we get and are able to share with everybody. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Derek, it's so nice to chat to you again, man. Yeah, sounds good. Um, you know, I think we maybe sold short a little bit, some of the 3d tools. And I know there's, a, I, I, maybe I can ask you, you know, I've heard some controversy here or in Europe that people are uncomfortable performing a morph uh, of what the patient may potentially look like. And I'm you know, wondering your thoughts about That's that. That's a great, thank you for asking that question. So uh, my side on the 3D side is my, the cone beam CT scanner and then the photography, but I've got both 2D and 3D photography. So generally, let's just chat about the photography side of things. The 2D photographs, we've got them absolutely standardized with mirrors that the patient look looks into. And I try and use those more for presentations because I sometimes think with a vector, there can be some slight differences compared to the 2D. So the vector that I use is absolutely for morphing with patients. And I think the important things for me is to, to be able to, so I've got a lady who takes the photographs and just will, will uh, cut just to the face, for example. Then I will go through with the patient in this simple standard that it has of actually analyzing the face and then saying, what could we potentially do? And I actually give the patients those pictures because I think it's important. On it, it's said it's a simulation. We don't know if it's going to happen. But from my side, I feel it's really important to do that. So when I'm traveling and consulting, I don't have the time to do it. I'll do it late in the evening. But when I'm at my actual uh, practice where people are, will morph. So I think it's crucial. And then what I do is those same images, we print them out and we take them to the OR with us and they're up against the wall so that you can actually see where you're at. And for me, the golden thing is you must under promise and over deliver because 
it's so easy to make a nose look beautiful on the computer, but when you've got to go do it on the table, it's a different yeah. thing. Eh? No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's the point I'd want to definitely get across yeah. is that these tools are not to guarantee that this is what a result will be, yeah. but it's more to get on the same page and serve as a communication tool because... Yeah. Um, you know, once a patient takes a look and sees maybe two options, uh, then they can mull it over, think about it. I do the same thing. I have them take pictures. If we have two options and think about it between the consult to the pre-op visit and the ultimate surgery and decide, do they want more of a super tip break, less of a super tip break, you know, those types of things. And I think it's also a good screening tool because if you're finding that patients want you know, every little pixel changed and every little, oh, in, uh, yeah. then sometimes that can be a red flag for body dysmorphia. Yeah, yeah. And if, uh, you know, maybe not understanding that this is just a 3D photo that you, you can only do so much uh, with the image yeah. uh, and that sort of divide or disconnect can sometimes be a red flag yeah. for, yeah. um you know, maybe an, a patient that can't be satisfied or unrealistic expectations, but it's incumbent upon us because you, like you say, you can do anything with the pixels to, and we have to know that what's biologically possible, what's not possible and mm -hmm. make sure that mm -hmm. we're not reflecting something that we don't think we can achieve. Yeah, yeah. And then the second point I would say is just that how valuable this is because it's an objective tool for research and following the outcomes of patients. Yes. You know, we've done several studies looking at edema, how how quickly does edema and what type of modifications to edema, you know, can we see with time in different graph types. For instance, you know, we looked at septal extension graph versus Collymeller strut and followed this for 18 months and showed differences from one subgroup to another. You can look at different gender differences, ethnic differences, et cetera. So yeah, yeah. You know, it's not just the morph and it's not certainly not promising a um, result, but it's communication, it's uh, screening patients, and it's performing research yeah. that I think are. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, and then the other side of the thing is the whole cone beam CT scan side. So I've got various opinions about that. For me, it's been a game changer. So to be able to have this in the practice, both for myself and for the patient. So if we speak just purely on the patient side of things, so I'm obviously otolaryngology trained, so we much more used to working inside the nose, but a patient, the two key things for me is, it only costs about $130 if they don't have insurance for the scan. It's done instantly, and the amount of radiation compared to conventional CT is so much less. So in terms of the patient, it's a no-brainer that you can do it. So by far the majority, close on 100% of my patients I'll operate will get a cone beam CT. From my side, why it's important is it's a diagnostic tool, but it's also a, a safety tool. So that if, if for example, I'm, I'm the, the, say that the septum is so severely deviated, you can't even endoscopically look inside one side of the nose, and then you do a CT scan and you see that there's a conchobulosa and there's a maxillary sinusitis and all sorts of things going on that you can't see. So, so diagnostically, that's really important. It's also important for the surgical planning because I can now, for example, see how much cartilage is there to potentially harvest. What are we going to do if we're going to possibly be doing a um, preservation technique, et cetera, et cetera. But also that scan then is in theater for me. So I can, during surgery, be seeing what I'm seeing in the patient. So I think CT scans in my mind is, is an, an absolute essential. What was interesting for, for me is after years of getting reports from the radiology colleagues, it's incredible what the difference is between a guy who can maybe write a three page report and a guy who writes a two sentence report. So what we ended up doing is with one of my, two of my radiology colleagues and a couple of guys from the States, we actually got together and we worked out what we've called the rhinoceros criteria. And um, I'm actually going to be presenting about that in Verona. So it's mm. been published. And the idea is it's just guidelines for radiologists to be able to understand what we as the rhinoplasty surgeons would like them to report on. And it's been very interesting. We've really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, that's excellent. It'd be great to take a look at that criteria. So do you have every one of your CBCTs read by a radiologist? Not all of them. If we have a problem, we can get them, get them done. Um, but they are for me to be able to use in theater most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Derek, it's been great to chat to you.
Um, thanks for everything you're doing for the world of rhinoplasty and facial plastics and orthognatic and all the stuff you do. And I really hope you have a great year for the rest of this year. Awesome. You too. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Good chatting. Lovely.